Um, I think this is a testament to the fact that Oak University, OU, um, plays a significant role in this area and has had a significant impact on the county and especially Rochester, of course. So I'm sure you all have your own experiences of OU and um, you know things that I don't know, uh, I'm sure. Uh, my own knowledge comes from working at Oakland since 2009 and being the coordinator of archives and special collections there since 2013, so not that long, but I've learned a lot about the history of the university uh, in that time frame. Um, the university archives uh, takes care of all the documentation that is preserved uh, for the history of the university and also uh, provides access to it. So we help people discover the resources that are in the archives. We answer people's questions, such as uh, when was the School of Engineering founded? Or do you have early photographs of the first basketball team? Or, and there's countless questions like that that we receive. We also have special collections. Uh, which are defined as archival collections, but they are not about the university's history. They're on other topics, and they're usually identified by their topics um, as well as by their origin. And hopefully at the end I will have time to talk about them a little bit more, because some of them do uh, pertain to local history. Uh, for example, well, not local history, but we have a collection of Civil War and Lincoln-related materials which was donated to us by William Springer in the 60s. We also have a collection of English women's writings from the 17th to 19th century. And we have a lot of local history related collections. Some of them are sort of illustrated on this slide. And uh, I'll mention just uh, one of them, two of them. The Oakland Press, the o archive of the Oakland Press is uh, with us and that's photographs, uh, as well as the microfilm of all the issues of the Oakland Press and its predecessors. We also have uh, tax rolls and other city and county uh, records of Oakland County. Um, and those are used a lot by genealogists and local historians. Um, you may wonder, before I get to the book, you may wonder why I wrote a book uh, about Oakland University and what brought me to Oakland University. As you may hear from my accent, that uh, I, I come from, I was born in a foreign country. I was born in France and I lived there until I married a Michigander and moved to Michigan in uh, 2005. And in France, I taught American history at a university. And when I moved here, I decided to uh, change careers and go back to school. So I went to the, the School of Information at the University of Michigan to get a master's in uh, library science. And uh, I did this because the, the, what I like best about history is the research part. So going to the archives, exploring all the sources, finding tidbits of information, making connections between different facts and establishing facts and, and stories of the past, really. So as an archivist and librarian, I help other people do that, and I discover these stories in the archives myself, which is really great fun. So I was really thrilled when I was able to become the coordinator of archives uh, in 2013. Now, generally, I think it's really important to um, understand the past if we want to know who we are. Uh, it's probably a cliche, but it's worth repeating, I think. It also, um, understanding the past helps us get more, well, improve our critical thinking, I think, because by analyzing and interpreting the past, you can better understand the present and have a different perspective on the present. So archives play an essential role in this regard, and um, they, um, their task is not just to, again, to preserve uh, the past, but also to make it available to people in the present. So tonight, I would like to show you a few aspects of uh, Oakland University's history uh, as they can be documented in the university archives. Um, at the same time, I will talk about the Arcadia book that you see here, which was published last year. And um, 
this means that um, this was about 60, well, 61 years ago now. It was published in 2000, the book was published last year in 2017, 60 years after the founding of the university, which was a really good timing. Uh, a lot has happened in 60 years, so obviously I'm not going to talk about all of those years. Uh, but think back to 1957, when Rochester had the population of about 5,000 people. It was a very small place, very different from what it is today. And it's in that setting that a university was created. So the book came into being because Arcadia Publishing contacted me in 2015 to write a book of um, historic photographs of the university in their campus series. And again, I thought it was a great opportunity to publish it for the 60th anniversary. Indeed, the university was founded in 1957 when it was announced that Alfred and Matilda Wilson would donate their estate, Meadowbrook Hall and the estate, as well as $2 million to Michigan State University to create a new campus in Oakland County. Before I talk about this incredible gift in more detail, let me talk a little bit about Meadowbrook itself. Meadowbrook is the land chosen by uh, John Dodge, the co-founder of uh, Dodge Motor Company, and his wife Matilda. Um, shortly after their marriage in 1908 uh, for their weekend uh, home, weekend country home. And they found the, pers the perfect spot in 1908, uh, in the location that you know today, it uh, became known as Meadowbrook Farms. John and Matilda used the original um, farmhouse on the property, um, which was a very charming home for a weekend retreat. And they started adding to the property, and adding land to the property, I mean, uh, to enlarge it. Uh, originally, the land was about uh, 350 acres, but the family started to expand the boundaries from the very beginning. So here we see um, an image of the original home, and uh, you can see clearly why they fell in love with it, because it embodied uh, the idyllic country life. So Matilda and John Dodge had three children together, uh, Francis, Danny, and Anna Margaret. However, in 1920, John Dodge and his brother both died of the flu, as you may know, leaving Matilda alone with three children and a big company to run, not by herself, obviously, um, but uh, she did um, oversee the operations of the Dodge Motor Company in the following years with her sister-in-law. Eventually, uh, well, no, I shouldn't go there yet. Eventually, she sold the business in 1925 for $146 million, which was the largest cash transaction ever performed of that nature. And it made her and her sister-in-law the wealthiest women in the world, probably. So, shortly thereafter, uh, actually, um, Matilda remarried. She married Alfred Wilson, who was a, a lumber broker, also a millionaire. And she had met him at church, and they decided to, to uh, continue the legacy of Meadowbrook and to uh, look at the property as a more permanent home rather than just a weekend or a vacation uh, residence. So they lived at the farmhouse and they started making plans uh, for Meadowbrook Hall. The hall itself was built uh, during the peak of the 1920s uh, boom or era of prosperity. It was built between 1926 and 29 at an overall cost of almost uh, $4 million. So I'm not going to talk about it in detail because it's not the point today, but I'll just mention that, uh, as you probably know, it is huge. Uh, it covers 88,000 square feet. It's got 110 rooms, and um, it used to uh, have 25 to about 30 staff to 
than just the hall, not the estate. So today it's the fourth largest museum in the United States, and as you probably know, it is a national historic landmark. Um, so Meadowbrook Hall is clearly an American estate because of its history, but at the same time, as you can see here, it looks like it's been here something like 500 years. And Matilda and Alfred lived there with their uh, children and two adopted children, Richard and Barbara. Uh, and during these years, the farm continued to grow. The Wilsons had hogs, cattle for beef and for dairy, uh, poultry, sheep, horses. Matilda was particularly proud of her Belgian horses that she was breeding. Um, the farm topped out at 1,400 acres and short of flour and sugar was pretty self-supporting. Um, with the hall included, there are some 37 historic buildings, structures, or objects on the property. And this is all important to know because this is what our university acquired in 1957. And many outbuildings are still preserved and used on campus today. In 1953, Matilda and Alfred decided to uh, build a retirement house, a smaller house on the Meadowbrook Farm property called Sunset Terrace. It was at, at this time that they also started thinking about their legacy and what was going to happen to the estate after, they, uh, after their passing. So they received a lot of suggestions. It is said that one suggestion was to uh, turn the uh, estate into a mental hospital, uh, Another one, turning Meadowbrook Hall into a rest home for tired automotive executives. Wow. Uh, that's <laughs> and of course, uh, Matilda and Alfred Wilson did not entertain those. Yeah. Let's now turn to the birth of the university itself. So at the same time as this was happening in the 50s, uh, the chair of the Oakland County Planning Commission, Robert Swanson, was pushing forward plans for a university in Oakland County. And there were many reasons to set up a university in this area. Um, and you have to understand a little bit more about the context of the 50s to fully grasp why Oakland University was born. First of all, there was a demographic boom. Uh, Oakland County at the time was the second largest county in Michigan. It had something like 516,000 people in 1957. And together with Macomb County, the population topped 1 million. Pontiac alone had about 80,000 people at the time. And more importantly still, the population in the county was growing fast. Um, these were the years of the baby boom. Uh, between 1945 and 1965, uh, the Census Bureau reported a record number of births in the U.S. as a whole, and in Michigan in particular. And the population of Oakland and Macomb County was expected to at least double in the following 25 years. And the babies that were born in very large numbers after the war would become of college age starting in 1964, so shortly thereafter. So demographics are definitely a factor to explain why a university was created here. At the same time, more and more high school graduates were seeking a post-secondary education. Um, the GI Bill of 1944 allowed over one million veterans to attend college, and demand grew for such an education, uh, especially since um, Cold War fears uh, made Americans think that, or fear rather, that they would be um, falling behind the Soviet Union, especially after the launch of Sputnik into space. And um, there was uh, a lot of support, financial support as well as social support uh, for all universities and colleges in the country at that time. The federal government provided funding, lots of states provided funding as well, and there was a broad consensus that a highly educated workforce was needed. So as a result of the demographic boom and the uh, democratization of higher education, 
student enrollment skyrocketed nationwide in those years. In Michigan specifically, uh, the state set up a task force to study the situation of uh, ed public uh, higher education in the state and to make recommendations to improve uh, and expand opportunities for would-be students. Um, the report, which was released in uh, 1958, predicted a tidal wave of students to come in Michigan. And it recommended that new institutions be built, especially in areas with populations in, uh, that didn't have any uh, institution yet. That meant Pontiac, Flint, and Saginaw were mentioned in that report specifically. So as I said, there was no higher education institution in Oakland County at the time, nor in Macomb County, except for a community college that just, uh, Macomb Community College that was just founded south of Macomb County. In addition, uh, the area was home to the top research headquarters of the American automobile industry, as you know. Chrysler had just announced plans for a research center just a few miles from the Meadowbrook estate. Um, in addition still, and maybe even more important, uh, the local infrastructure in this area was developing. And by this I mean more freeways and roads that made the area accessible from Detroit, from Macomb County, places like Mount Clemens uh, East. Um, the first segments of I-75 had been laid and there were plans to extend it all the way to this area. And then M59, which was uh, uh, in this east-west uh, artery, also uh, had preliminary plans to expand it. And in fact, it, it was in 1966 that the first freeway part of M59 was built, and it was between Rochester and Pontiac. So from this perspective, Meadowbrook was the perfect spot. It's right at the intersection of I-75 and N-59. So when Robert Swanson, who was the chair of the Oakland County Planning Commission, uh, approached the Wilsons with the idea, Matilda was immediately attracted to it. And she and Alfred contacted John Hanna, who was the president of Michigan State University and the friend of the family. Uh, they wanted to see if Hannah had any desire to uh, acquire this their property to create a new campus there. So here you see John Hannah, the tall man in the middle, um, shaking hands with the uh, mayor of Rochester at the time, or rather the president of the village of Rochester, and he's being made an honorary citizen of Rochester in uh, 57 or, yes, in the... Uh, 57. Uh, the lady in the fur coat beside him is, of course, Mrs. Wilson. And the other lady on the left is Sarah Van Hosen Jones, who also owned uh, an estate in the area and who also donated it to Michigan State University uh, at the same time. So um, Matilda had met uh, John Hanna very early on when uh, he was a young agricultural agent and uh, he had helped her develop her poultry uh, poultry stock on the, on the estate. And uh, they had also connected through um, the State Board of Agriculture, which is the governing body of Michigan State University, on which Matilda Wilson had sat. So at a lunch in Lansing in 1956, John Hanna and Matilda Wilson were having uh, well, a conversation and uh, she mentioned the possibility of the donation and uh, Hanna expressed a strong interest. So it's been said that Robert Swanson, who actually had the original idea, would have preferred the campus to go to um, your, the University of Michigan, which was his alma mater, but if so, he was disappointed. The total gift of 1,400 acres and $2 million was made public on the 3rd of January, 1957, and it was estimated at about $10 million at least. 
the first employee of the university, the very first employee was George Karras. He was hired in 57 by Mrs. Wilson. He had worked at Michigan State as a, an engineer for their physical plant, and he was tapped to come to Oakland County to start making plans for the new campus. You have to keep in mind that at the time there was no utilities in the area, no sewer system, no city water system, no electricity. It was all to be built. Um, George Karras, as the campus engineer, the director of the physical plant, uh, would play a very important role in developing, um, laying out the campus. He helped choose the spot for the first building on the west side of Meadowbrook Estate and he coordinated the development of the utilities, the landscaping, the first buildings, all of that. Here is a photo of the groundbreaking ceremony, uh, which took place in May 1958. And um, as I mentioned, in that, at that time, the area had barely begun the process of urbanization that would eventually transform it into the suburbs and urban area we know today. At the time, unpaved roads predominated. Um, the main road was a two-lane uh, asphalt county road uh, that ran along the estate's northern border at the top between Pontiac and Rochester. Pontiac was five miles away, Rochester four miles away on the other side. And the west side uh, of the Wilson Estate, where you see uh, in red the plans for the new buildings, the North and South Foundation as well as the proposed student center. So that west side of the Wilson Estate was at the limit between what was then Pontiac Township and Rochester itself. So you may have heard that story that the postal address of the university should have been Pontiac, but Mrs. Wilson lived in Rochester and she wanted the address of the new university to be uh, Rochester. So thanks to her connections, uh, she made it happen. And uh, the address was and remains to this day uh, in Rochester, even though it now sits in Auburn Hills. The new university would be named Michigan State University Oakland, or MSUO. Right? And the first building, Foundation Hall, was intended to be a, a no-nonsense brick building that would contain everything a university needed, from classrooms, 39 classrooms, uh, a library, laboratories, offices for the administration and the faculty. And it was even equipped for television-based uh, distance education because uh, the man who was chosen to lead the university, Woody Varner, uh, thought that distance education using the latest technology was, would be the future. I've read that this um, no-nonsense appearance, as you can see here in the photo of South Foundation Hall, um, was deliberate. The idea was to focus on academics, not on uh, extracurricular activities. And this corresponded well to the institution's philosophy. I believe, however, that it was also convenient to uh, build these, this kind of very simple uh, building, architecturally speaking, because it was inexpensive. Uh, the total cost per square foot was only $14, which was well below average at the time. And also it could happen quickly. And you know, the groundbreaking was in May 58 and a charter class would start in the fall of 59. So they didn't have a lot of time. So you may have heard that Oakland University was presented at the time as the Harvard of the Midwest, uh, but that's not really true. Uh, if its founders, well, it never was, but it never even intended to be. It's, it's, if its founders had a model in mind, it was more the, uh, small liberal arts college like Dartmouth or Swarthmore or Brown, not a Harvard, not a large research university, but more a small liberal arts college focusing on undergraduate education, excellent undergraduate education in the liberal arts. Um, the curriculum was uh, developed progressively uh, in a two-pronged way by people at Michigan State as well as 
uh, what came to be called as the Meadowbrook Seminars, which was a series of meetings held at Meadowbrook Hall in 1958 and 1959, which gathered experts from around the country to discuss the curriculum of the future university and also its, um, its um, values and philosophy. So there were very prominent people participating in those seminars. Uh, Henry Luce, who was the founder and the manager of Time magazine, uh, came. Milton Eisenhower, the president of John Hopkins University. Um, also Henry Steele Commager, the famous historian, and so on and so forth. Lots of well-known people nationally. And the purpose of these seminars was to hammer out the curriculum, but also to put OU on the national map because this was widely advertised across the country in Time, in the New York Times, in all the major newspapers and magazines of the era. And uh, the, um, the idea was to uh, create publicity and promotion for the new university that way. So I would say that I'm not going to talk about the curriculum much, but the, the purpose was to make it innovative and even experimental. Uh, to have it shaped from a clean slate, starting from scratch, really, and shedding aside traditional ideas of education. So it was shaped in part by these people, the attendees of the Meadowbrook seminars, and also by the charter faculty, all 24 of them, who were recruited by the chancellor, Woody Varner. Um, there are interviews that were made of these people in the late 90s, and they all say how easy it was to be hired at Oakland at the time. Basically, one man did it. It was the chancellor himself, Woody Varner. Uh, sometimes these people expressed interest in OU, and then Woody Varner would go visit them and convince them to come to uh, the campus, or the, the, the future campus, to take a look and, um, and, and see for themselves. And he would invite them to dinner. And basically, that was it. After that, they were hired. A brief visit, a dinner, and if they agreed, they would be hired. It took a lot of, um, you have to imagine, it was a, a leap of faith because there was nothing but mud and half-finished buildings when those future faculty members visited. And uh, it took some very motivated people to uh, come to Oakland University, or MSUO, at the time. So typically, they were uh, very young. They were recent graduates, recent PhDs. The youngest was um, Tom, um, Paul, rather, sorry, Tom Bullion, who was 22 at the time. Or rather, he had obtained his PhD at the age of 22, very young. And I think pretty much all of them, or almost all of them, were PhDs, which was rare also at the time. Uh, many uh, faculty had master's degrees rather than PhDs. So the first year, there were 24 faculty members and all in all 72 employees. There were also 570 students who enrolled in the fall of 1959. And here you see at the center, Chancellor Varner, Woody Varner, as he was called, surrounded by students during the first orientation in the summer of 59. Participants uh, describe it as one big family uh, where administrators, staff, faculty, and students would all mingle and know each other. And that's probably because there was only one building. So they were all under the same roof. And you know, the chancellor was only down the, the hallway or around the corner, uh, along with all the faculty members and the students if they wanted to uh, see them. So um, um, you have to imagine what it was like at the time. I've, I've heard a charter class member mention that when you were in that building, you could see on the west side the parking lot with all the cars of the students and the faculty. And on the other side, you can see fields, including Matilda Wilson's Belgian horses grazing uh, in the area that is today the library. So unfortunately, we don't have photos of that, although we do have photos of uh, uh, the fields and the, the, the animals, the cattle, and all that were, that were still there. So who were the students who attended Oakland University who decided to attend a brand new campus? Um, 
Well, most of them came from Oakland County. Three-fourths of them actually came from Oakland County. Almost um, two-thirds came from families with fathers who had no college education, uh, who were either working class or lower middle class or middle class. And it's an understatement to say that um, the students were not very well prepared for uh, something like what the young PhDs uh, were going to give them, <laughs> what they were planning for them. They were not prepared uh, psychologically or even academically for it, as I will explain. Um, many uh, ambitions to be uh, teachers or a career in liberal arts, but the faculty expectations were very different from those of the students, and this caused tensions in the first year uh, at Oakland. There's actually a book by a famous sociologist, David Reisman, who um, studied the first 10 years at Oakland University and uh, explains a lot of this really, really well, I think. So if you're interested, there's a lot more in that book. So the first semester, I must say, was not very successful in the sense that um, it was revealed in the press that 70% of the entering class had failed their classes the first semester, 70%. This was not quite true, actually, but it was pretty bad. Uh, in fact, about one third received a failing grade in uh, at least one course, and a similar proportion received uh, overall Ds or in that vicinity. So here are the students burning their blue books. Oh, sorry, I forgot that one. That's the first convocation. Burning their blue books at the end of the first semester after all the hard work. But you may wonder why such poor results. It was not really the student's fault. It was not really the faculty's fault either. It was, uh, let's say, what happens when you start something from scratch. Uh, there is no doubt that the students were very hardworking and very serious. Everybody describes them as maybe even too serious. Um, and so different explanations have been put forward. For the um, sociologist I was telling you about, David Riesman, um, it was mostly because of the faculty. They had expectations that came from uh, graduate schools. They were young graduates themselves. And so they had been teaching and learning at this level whereas their students were just fresh out of high school at a lower level. And the faculty didn't quite have the ability to adjust to this, yet at least. Furthermore, they came from large cities, whether on the East Coast or in Chicago, and they were not quite ready for the Oakland County type of population. It was still largely rural or semi-rural at the time. Um, as for the administration at OU, the chancellor and the uh, other administrators, they probably thought that the faculty was too harsh, too demanding. Um, the university's first annual report mentions that the economics course, for example, was that normally taught to sophomores and that it covered in one quarter what was normally taught in two quarters. So in other words, they really tried to do too much and at the level that was not suitable for freshmen, at least according to uh, this report. The faculty, by contrast, think that it comes from the fact that the students were not prepared enough, that their high schools had not prepared them enough for uh, higher education. One of them uh, in the, mentions that they had received no advising in high school. They had not been tested to see what uh, feels they could have been, been best been matched to. Uh, and um, they signed up for whatever they wanted. And once they were in, they couldn't get out because there was no dropout policy at the time. So they had to continue all the way to the bitter end. And uh, it, was, it resulted in uh, the, the kinds of grades that I was telling you about. So by the end of the first semester, um, about 40 of them dropped out and 30 more did not register for winter classes. But then new students started enrolling as well. So the grand total of the second semester was 535. So first semester, 570. Second semester, 535. 
So quickly, the young MSUO would turn into OU or Oakland University. In April 1963, 146 students graduated, and about 100 more of the original 570 were still enrolled at Oakland University. So that's about 246 remaining of their charter class uh, at that point. Interestingly, men dropped out in greater numbers than women. So originally in 1959, there were about two men for every woman. And by 1961, there were slightly fewer men than women. The women had become the majority of the student's body by 1961. And it's quite interesting if you talk to some of the charter class members that they're very proud of having been at OU and who have to, uh, they're very proud of having survived what some of them called the boot camp that was Oakland University at the time. Um, they say that uh, OU was a place where the professors did all the teaching, not teaching assistants, and where they got to know everyone, which is something that they didn't forget. Also, in 1963, when a charter class graduated, uh, MSUO was renamed Oakland University because this way the name Oakland would be on their diplomas, not uh, MSU. And after that, well, uh, the number of students skyrocketed. Uh, in fall 63, there was 1,500 students already. Meanwhile, um, Matilda uh, and Alfred Wilson were still around, but Alfred Wilson passed away in 1962. And Matilda remained um, at Meadowbrook until her death in 1967. And she uh, stayed very much involved in the life of the university. Um, she uh, left a strong mark, you could say, on the university. As you can see here, she participated in every groundbreaking and in every ceremony to mark the, uh, a new building. In this case, this is our 61st, uh, 65th birthday, and she's cutting a cake in the shape of Wilson Hall, the future Wilson Hall that was going to be built uh, that year. She also cared about academic excellence and created the Alfred and Matilda Wilson Award to recognize um, promising Oakland University students. And she treated the students like her children, really, participating in a lot of university events uh, and having students over at Meadowbrook Hall uh, repeatedly. In uh, these two um, photos, the, the, um, you can see the rings, or rather you can imagine the rings, that she gave a gold and diamond ring to every student who graduated from the charter class. And you see on the left, uh, the students packing the rings in uh, boxes, and then on the right, a student showing her ring to uh, Chancellor Varner. So again, you just have to imagine the rings, unfortunately. So the origins of Oakland University left their mark on the campus. Um, as I've said, until the donation from the Wilsons, it was an active farm, and uh, they had there were barns, there were animals, there were fields. And this, in this aerial view, you can see on the left, North and South Foundation, right behind the parking lot. And still behind, you can see the small Oakland Center, the student center that had just been completed. And then on the other side, on the right, you see two buildings being built. One is Hannah Hall, the uh, Hall of Science, and then in the background, the library whose foundations are just showing. So this is about 1960, and you see, of course, all around uh, some barns, some homes, farm homes, and the like. Now, the, the barns disappeared little by little as new buildings were erected on campus. And the barns disappeared either through neglect or fire, as in this case. Some of you may remember this was the theater barn it was located behind Hannah Hall, and he housed, it housed the Student Enterprise Theater for many years until it burned down in 1987. And then to the early no-nonsense brick buildings were added more contemporary uh, buildings, starting with this one here, which is O'Dowd Hall in 1980. 
Now, I talked about the tensions between the faculty and the students' expectations in the, at the very beginning. And it took time for these two distinct worlds, the faculty and the students, to adjust to each other. Uh, Oakland County became more urbanized, became a lot more diverse than it had been in 1959. The student profiles diversified. Uh, through the 60s, especially with the economic prosperity, uh, the students' um, socioeconomic status uh, increased. And uh, on the other hand, the OU curriculum and the OU faculty expanded and adjusted to local needs. So here are some examples of classes that were held at OU um, through the 60s and beyond. Um, there is partnerships with local companies that were encouraged, as this one here, which is continuing education in partnership with uh, GM. There was the Kettering Magnetis Magnetics Lab on the right, uh, which brought advanced physics research in 1964. Um, engineering was always very important at OU from the beginning. And uh, it is said that uh, when Matilda was asked what kind of uh, fields she would like to be taught uh, to, at Oakland, she said automobile engineering, of course. And you see here on the right uh, an electric car, the Oakland Electric, that was produced by um, OU engineering students to participate in a, in a race. Interestingly, after the book was published, the uh, student who donated his car to build this electric car contacted me and told me the story. So it's kind of a interesting, but anyway. Also important at OU uh, was nursing and health sciences and something called at the time area studies. Area studies means the studies of non-Western civilizations, basically. And again, you have to think uh, in the context of the 50s and uh, 60s, when uh, in terms of uh, international relations, the, the, the big players were Russia and China. And there were uh, courses in uh, Russian and Chinese at Oakland from the beginning, as well as classes in the history of China and India. And you see here on these two photos, uh, a, a, a historical moment, or a historic moment really, in 1972, when the Chinese delegation of the national uh, table tennis team came to Oakland University. This was the first time in 23 years that a Chinese delegation had been invited to the United States. And it marked the beginning of the thaw of the uh, hostilities between the US and China that would lead to the recognition of uh, uh, China and the opening of um, diplomatic relations uh, between the U.S. and China in 1979. So OU was really uh, there to uh, welcome this Chinese delegation in 1972. Also uh, important to note are um, uh, music, theater, and dance, and the arts in general. Uh, there were very innovative art programs at the OU mostly because of the presence of the Meadowbrook Music Festival. Oops, sorry, went too quickly here. And uh, the Meadowbrook Theater, uh, which, as you probably know, were set up in the 60s as well. And the Meadowbrook Music Festival and the theater brought in professionals and artists of the highest level who also became instructors at Oakland and taught our students and who provided students with uh, opportunities to perform professionally. Now, I'd like to talk a bit more about student life, what it was like to be at OU in the 60s especially. Uh, at the beginning, there was no infrastructure, and that means there were no dorms. Right? No, all the students were commuters, except for a few who found housing in buildings on, on around, or around the estate. Private homes, uh, as the farmhouse on the right, or uh, converted farmhouses from the Meadowbrook farms, uh, like the one on the left. This is a former milk processing building that housed five students in the first two years of the university. And it was the object of a very funny article in the Detroit Free Press that uh, ironically described 
uh, the comfort or rather the lack of comfort in that former milk processing uh, building. So since there were no uh, dorms, this means that most students left at the end of the day when their classes were over. And uh, it was the people who were there in the first year say it was pretty deserted after class time. Uh, things began to change when um, dorms were built to accommodate student housing. The first uh, dorms were these here, Annabelle and Fitzgerald House, built in 1962, that could house 120 students. Then came Prial House, and the following year, Hill House, that you see here on the right, which increased resident capacity to 500 students. And as a result, student life began to change. There are many examples of that in the book. One photo that I particularly like is this tug of war in the mud. You know where that is? That's in Beer Lake, the future Beer Lake, before it was filled with water. Because when the uh, um, Vandenberg Hall, which is right across from it, was being built, and in front of it was this mud pit that would be filled with water, <laughs> and the students just loved it uh, during the couple of years that the construction was ongoing, they played in the mud. Once it was filled, they loved to kayak and even swim in Bear Lake, which is absolutely impossible to do now. It's uh, not allowed for safety reasons. There's all other photos, such as this one, where you see uh, students practicing their skills at archery, watching TV in the Oakland Center, Enjoying a concert or weekly dances. Here is one uh, party in the patio of the student center at night. So there are countless photos of student life on campus. Some of them are in the book and many, many more are in uh, the archives of the university. Also, we uh, included photos of athletic activities. Uh, as you may know, in the first few years, intercollegiate uh, athletics were not allowed on campus. There were no intercollegiate sports. And after 1964, the chancellor went against the wishes of his own faculty and decided to allow varsity basketball, uh, no, not basketball, swimming and, and cross country, which you can see here in these two photos. Basketball was started two years later in 1966. And interestingly, it can be argued that these are still the most successful sports at OU um, today. Now, the creation of the and the development of the first university in Oakland County brought new opportunities um, to the local communities. And conversely, um, they provided opportunities for OU. One thing that OU started to do uh, pretty quickly was to invite speakers uh, to campus, which was open to the general public. Uh, here you see um, Roy Wilkins, who was the executive director of the NAACP in 1966. Here is Governor Romney, surrounded by uh, Oakland students. And here is the Meadowbrook Music Festival, which of course, when it uh, opened in 1964, became a very important venue and uh, cultural uh, beacon in Oakland County and beyond. The festival was originally the uh, summer venue of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, and after 1970, it expanded to uh, popular music. There were also partnerships with local high schools, as you can see here in the Cadet Engineering Program, which started in 1970 to help minority high school students embrace engineering. And here is a photo of the Rochester Apple Amble, which took place in the 1980s. This was a five mile road run between campus and the center of Rochester. I don't know if any of you remember that. But it was actually very hard to find information about that uh, particular event. I could go on and on, but I would like to move on now and talk a little bit about the, um, the book itself and how I uh, made it. Well, the book is, was organized chronologically, which is not very surprising. And I, um, 
highlighted the tenures of the seven presidents of Open University, from uh, Woody Varner to the current president, Ora Peskovitz. One thing, of course, that is worth noting is OU's official independence in 1970. Uh, and many people don't know that until then, um, OU was still part of MSU officially. There was only one board of trustees, and it was that of MSU, even though in practice, Oakland was making its own decisions already. But after 1970, its independence was officially recognized, and the university got its first um, board of trustees. What I try to highlight in the book is the transformation of the area and of the campus, which went hand in hand, from a rural, uh, isolated uh, community to uh, Metropolitan Research University uh, in a highly populated area in Oakland County. So through those changes, we can see how, how you developed and how it, um, how it developed its distinctive features and its values. So for the book, I chose some iconic images of OU. I showed you some of them, as well as some that are not as well known. This is the ski club at Oakland University which no longer exists, of course. Here is the first automated computerized library circulation system. That was in, uh, I forget the exact date, in the mid 60s as well, so very early on. So this and other stories draw from the collection of photographs that are in the archives of the university, as well as some photos from Meadowbrook Hall and from Michigan State itself. It was not so easy to select photos because there are so many of them. And sometimes it's also not so easy to find information about the photos. For example, here is a photo that I wanted to include in the book. And that shows, if you're familiar with the history of the university, it shows Matilda Wilson with Paula Varner, who was the wife of Chancellor Varner. And if you can read the fine print in the back, you can see that this took place at the Meadowbrook Theater. And then I did some research in some of the collections of the archives, and I found out in this newsletter that this was the premiere night, the opening of the Meadowbrook Theater. And uh, there was a lot more information in that newsletter, and I was able to write the caption that would go with the image to include it in the book. So that's how I proceeded. I selected photos and then did some research to try and find out more about what the photos represented. And I used newsletters. I used the student newspaper. I used the yearbooks. We have some yearbooks for the university. Uh, and also some uh, digital sources, because some of these materials have been digitized and are available online at the address that you see here on the screen. Um, now I'm moving on to something else. So I don't know if I have a, a few more minutes to talk about uh, other collections that we have uh, in the archives. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, and that will be the last part of my talk, is that we may have a lot of photographs and a lot of things in the archives, but what I found out when researching this book is that we don't have everything. There are photographs, there are things that are not documented, uh, there are photographs that I don't know who the people are. Maybe some of you, other people might know, but uh, of course, uh, that may, I may never be able to find out. And the lesson I draw from this is that not everything makes it into an archives. You might think that we have the complete history of Oakland University, but we do not, because we depend on people to donate materials to the archives, to give us the things that are going to be preserved uh, for to, to document the history of the university. And so we're missing some things. And uh, I urge people who may have interesting photographs or materials of the university to contact us uh, to see if they want to donate these materials to us so we can preserve them and give access to them uh, to future generations. Um, the story of the Oakland Press is a good example of that. We recently acquired their full archives, and um, it was almost lost because 
um, the Oakland Press building in Pontiac uh, was going to close down and the Oakland Press operations were moved to Troy. And well, they had no plans for their archives, all the documents, all the newspapers that were still in that building. Fortunately enough, uh, a member of uh, Oakland University uh, learned about it, contacted us, and we decided that we would take this collection. So we have the entire run of microfilms of the Oakland Press, formerly the Pontiac Press, going all the way back to the 1840s. It's a very old newspaper. We have lots of photographs, such as these, as are just a few samples. Uh, for some unknown reason, we only have photographs that go from the 60s to the 2000s. We don't know what happened to the older photographs. And again, that's part of the stories of archives. Some things get preserved and others not. Uh, you know, some things get lost, things get forgotten, and who knows where those photos ended up. So this collection is actually quite useful to uh, people who do local history. We've already had a lot of requests from people who uh, write books or who do, who do documentaries uh, related to the history of this area. We have a lot of other collections in our special collections, so I encourage you to, contact, to look at our website uh, where we have a full list. Uh, we have a few that I would like to share with you, including one here, the Eugene Mack papers, uh, which um, deal with local history. Eugene Mack was a uh, farmer, a businessman, and a civic leader in Addison Township in the north of Oakland County uh, for a large part of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th. And uh, we have um, his, own, his personal archives, which documents the life of schools, the development of the telephone, and a lot more in this area. We also have the records of the Oakland County Sanitarium, which some of you may remember, uh, a sanitarium that operated here between 1927 and uh, uh, 1964, um, and so on and so forth. Each of those cast a different light on our history. So to conclude, I would just say history is fun, because since I wrote this book, I've been contacted by many people who wanted to share their stories. And here is one of them, Ray Barcolo, who was a member of the um, charter class. And actually, no, he enrolled in 1964, sorry. But he joined the first varsity swim team. And he sent me the photo you see on the left after he saw the stories that I did in the book. He's the gentleman on the far left here. And he shared with me all kinds of other photographs and uh, stories of his life on campus in the 60s. I was also contacted by another one who um, uh, was the one who owned the car that I showed you earlier. It also happened to be working for uh, the Office of Public Relations of Oakland University at the time, so he was a photographer on campus in the 60s and early 70s, so it was great fun to uh, talk with him and, and share stories as well. So history is definitely fun, but as I said, as I got started, it's also important to know history, to understand where we are, and that's certainly the case of Oakland University. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try and answer them, answer them at this point. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Was there a jump in enrollment uh, in the 60s uh, during the beginning of the Vietnam War? I have heard that, but I don't know. I haven't looked at that specifically. Clearly, there was a, a huge increase in enrollment through the 60s, but part of it is just demographics. This is the years of the baby boom. And as I said, uh, the, the, the babies born right after the war were reaching college age in 1964 anyway. So regardless, there would have been a lot more uh, young people coming to Avion. So it's, it was already mostly done by then. Uh, I think it took them a few years to uh, 
to adjust. I mean, it's a slow process. So obviously it continued, but the, the, the most severe problems had been ironed out very quickly uh, after that. Um, so yeah, it's tremendous increase through the 60s and not just at Oakland. So maybe it would be hard to figure out what part of that increase is due to the, the Vietnam War uh, deferment. Uh, I don't know. I, it's an interesting question. I would like to look into it. Yes, back there. Oh. Yes, it was to attract faculty uh, because there was not much housing in this area at the time. As I said, you know, Rochester was uh, five miles away, Pontiac was four miles on the other side, and around the estate there was, you know, there was nothing ap apart from farms. And um, housing was not easy to come by, especially for young faculty who didn't have uh, very high incomes. Uh, and so Chancellor Varner wanted to very quickly develop housing and was able to get the faculty subdivision um, ready and available to faculty fairly quickly. I don't know the details that well, I must say. It's one area that I need to investigate more. Uh, I know one of our former colleagues, Richard Stamps, is actually researching uh, that particular story because he lives there. Oh. Yes. I grew up in the neighborhood. Um, my parents bought their house on January 1st, 1964, for 25 five. It was a four bedroom, um, four and a half bath. No, yeah, three and a half bath. Um, and we then, um, my dad was a young PhD. Um, Brad, who was um, wooed by Shanshan Warner, comes from um, Marquette, University of Milwaukee. And my mother was not thrilled when she arrived. <laughs> what was his name? It, Robert Simmons. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he, he taught there from the summer of 1960 um, until he tried to make it. The neighborhood was great because it was all faculty and staff. Um, it was a small, the university was very small, the neighborhood was small, so everyone um, worked together, we lived together, we worked out for each other, it was a great um, area to go up. And because the university was a commuter college, when they began attracting foreign exchange students, and when they closed for Thanksgiving break, the dorms closed. Christmas break, the dorms closed. So those foreign students, if they couldn't go home, that's where they went. They spent the vacation with I didn't mention that uh, for, the at the, for the charter class, there were four out of state students. You know, of, out of the 570 that started, there were four out of state students only. Yes. Sorry. What's that? I can't hear you. It's at the corner of Avon and no. Adams. Yeah. You go down Avon Road and you it's just east of campus, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, you leased, you bought that home, but you got a 99-year lease for the land. Um, from the homes that didn't sell, and that you currently come down, so if you, if you drive through or pass the neighborhood, you'll see a couple houses in the going to lot. But there were about 350 houses in there. There was somebody here who's. I wanted to ask the same question. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, you, you mean after the first year? Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I haven't looked at that specifically, and I. Okay. So you thought it was a good idea to? I know it was a fairly controversial system, at least among the faculty at the time. I've seen debates about whether to 
to do it, but and it doesn't, well, it's a completely different system today, so, yes. What's the current enrollment, and what, uh, what's the volume of that on campus in form not that's a good question. I don't know what the exact enrollment is going to be this year. I would say, you know, we've passed the 20,000 uh, mark a couple of years ago. 22. Oh, you looked into it. <laughs> yes, and maybe uh, Steve back there could answer as well. And I don't know how many are, are residing on campus either, I must say. Uh, do you know? With the expansion Right around 20% of the population well, a lot more than it used to be, that's for sure. And there's a lot of demand for it. I mean, it fills up quickly. Yeah, this dates back to the 90s. Uh, before that, it was the pioneer. Um, and the pioneer was because, well, both the students and the faculty in the early days felt like pioneers. Uh, they were building everything from scratch, you know, they were. Um, and the grizzly was because, well, they, the, I think it was, a, yes, maybe you can answer. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, I was trying to think of how to formulate it. Yeah, that was adopted early on and it has remained. But yeah, the, the pioneer was not, yeah, wasn't, the pioneer was not fierce enough for uh, the kind of athletics that OU now engaged in. Yes. Uh, when you were speaking of the Meadowbrook seminars, it sounded like um, Matilda Dowd's influence um, brought together all these famous people. And did they pattern the curriculum after any Ivy League schools, or what did they do that was so different? Not that much, it, it turns out, I think, but uh, they. Um, uh, they had broad ideas, but no, they did not use any um, specific university as a model. Um, it was more about um, um, they didn't really, you know, it was not um, meetings to lay out actually classes or sequences of classes that would lead to a diploma. It was more about the underlying philosophy and what they could uh, um, come out of it. There's a document online in our archives that uh, uh, is a, something like a 50 page document actually that lays out uh, some of these uh, values. They, they distinguished between different disciplines. So there was um, one for business, one for education, one for liberal arts, and continuing education was another one because they thought that continuing education had a, there was a great need for it in Oakland County. Um, they had. They actually did studies, um, surveys of the population in the area to ask them what they would expect from uh, an institution of higher learning, and continuing education was one of those things. But there are some. Um, there's more general principles than a real curriculum. The curriculum was drafted by um, MSU people mostly. Um, Thomas Hamilton, who was vice president, was the provost, the equivalent of the provost at MSU, and had teams of uh, MSU faculty draft the, the basis of the, of the curriculum. Yes. Yeah, this was the deliberate choice from the start. Um, it could have been a branch of MSU, but uh, MSU didn't want that. They wanted, from the start, an institution that would have its autonomy, that would make its own um, academic decisions, financial decisions, uh, pretty much everything. And I think they weighed the pros and cons of having a, a branch, but um, they, 
I'm not exactly sure why they went with that. All I know is that in 1958, when the um, task force that the state had uh, set up uh, to study the situation of higher education in Michigan as a whole, in 1958, when the report came out, one of the things they recommended is that new institutions be started, but not branches. They thought it sh they should be independent institutions. And um, the situation served Oakland well, because uh, they could do whatever they wanted. They were given free reign, but they could rely on MSU for support in terms of finances, expertise. As I said, the curriculum was devised in large part by MSU people, uh, infrastructure, anything they needed, really. They started from scratch, but they had like a, a backup that they could rely on uh, if they needed to, which they did, obviously, at the beginning. I don't know if that answers your question. I know it's kind of a unique situation where it was independent, but part of MSU, and uh, not truly officially independent until 1970. Any other questions? Yes. No, I don't actually. I haven't studied the more recent history as much yet. <laughs> I must admit. Um, can you tell me more about it, or do you know more about it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, a lot of um, competition between uh, MSU and U of M, University of Michigan at the time. And, uh, uh, you know, University of Michigan was creating its branches in Dearborn and in Flint at exactly the same time. And uh, there was a rumor that uh, uh, the University of Michigan was trying to, uh, to surround MSU with its own branches. And so OU um, came to the rescue, you know, in that, in that regard. So anyway. If there are, um, if you'd like to know more about the book, there are some copies back there, uh, just to take a look at it or even purchase it if you're interested. And you're welcome. <laughs>